to talk about Martha Root is very difficult. I cannot possibly match the talk that was given by the granddaughter of Dorothy Baker. I do not have the same kind of link. Though perhaps I have a spiritual link, as we all do, with Martha Root. And so in reading about her, I tried to identify myself with her in some ways in order to feel more closely uh, her significance. And like me, she was, at least for a brief time, a teacher, a school teacher. And like me, she was very interested in languages. And so, as I read about her life, I began to feel more and more um, attracted to water as a person. But to understand the significance of the life and work of Martha Root, I feel we need to see them in relation to Abdul Baha's Tablets of the Divine Plan, for it was in obedience to their call that she arose to spend the rest of her life teaching throughout the world. How can any Baha'i fail to be moved by Abdul Baha's cry? Oh, that I could travel, even though on foot and in the utmost poverty, to these regions, and raising the call of Ya Baha'u'llah Pa in cities, villages, mountains, deserts and oceans, promote the divine teachings. This, alas, I cannot do. How intensely I deplore it. Please, God, ye may achieve it. And so she did. More than any other Baha'i in the 141 years of our history. To understand the significance of the life and work of Martha Root, I feel we also need to study the tributes paid to her by Abdul Baha and Shori Effendi in order to understand how important, how unique Martha Root is among the many servants of Baha. And this is what Abdul Baha wrote of her. Or to her, in fact. Thou art in truth a herald of the kingdom and a harbinger of the covenant. Thou art truly self-sacrificing. Thou showest kindness unto all nations. Thou art sowing a seed that shall in due time give rise to thousands of harvests. Thou art planting a tree that shall eternally put forth leaves and blossoms and yield fruits, and whose shadow shall day by day grow in magnitude. Shori Effendi leaves us in no doubt as to Martha Root's station when he writes in God Passes By that she has covered herself with a glory that has not only eclipsed the achievements of the teachers of the faith among her contemporaries, the globe around, but has outshone the feats accomplished by any of its propagators in the course of an entire century. To Martha Root, that archetype of Baha'i itinerant teachers, and the foremost hand raised by Baha'u'llah since Abdul Baha's passing, must be awarded the title of leading ambassadress of his faith and pride of Baha'i teachers, whether men or women, in both the East and the West. Shori Effendi goes on to say of her life as one which may well be regarded as the fairest fruit as yet yielded by the formative age of the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. This immortal heroine yielded an obedience of which the present as well as future generations may be proud and which they may emulate. Writing to Roy Wilhelm, who had first introduced Martha to the Baha'i faith, Shuri Effendi's secretary on his behalf wrote that her death constitutes the heaviest blow which the teaching force not only in America 
but throughout the entire Baha'i world, has sustained since the passing of Abdul Baha. To the Baha'is of Iran, Shuri Effendi cabled in Persian, the pure leaf, the illustrious teacher, the sign of detachment, the torch of love and affection, the example of courage and faithfulness, the consolation of the people of Baha. Martha Root has ascended to the summit of eternal habitation. On a card printed in London, England, for a lecture tour in 1926, Martha described herself as Baha'i, Esperantist, international journalist, and international lecturer. Those were very modest descriptions of herself, considering what has been written about her. And if we should ever seek justification for studying her life, I don't think we'll find anything more complimentary about any human being on this earth, with the exception of Abdul Baha and Shari Effendi themselves. Martha Root may be the archetype of Baha'i itinerant teachers, but if you had chosen her for the central character of a popular novel, she would not have been an archetypal heroine in the way we have all come to expect. Martha was not tall, physically strong, or physically beautiful. She was not rich. She did not travel in style, dress extravagantly, or eat generously. She was not young when she set out, and she did not enjoy good health. But does not that make her so very human? Does that, does that not mean that we can identify so much more closely with her? And does that not mean that her, that her deeds are somehow so much more remarkable for all that? Martha worked her way around the world, travelling third class, eating frugally, dressing plainly. There were those who write of her that she had absolutely no dress sense whatsoever and would wear whatever clothes people gave to her out of pity for her condition. A small, frail figure in middle age, easily exhausted and often unwell. Yet she had talents and she used them to the full. She was an experienced and accomplished journalist an Esperantist, and a fearless speaker. She was generous and loving to all she met. She never married. Her life was for the faith, and her beloved was Baha'u'llah. Born Martha Louise Root on August the 10th, 1872, in Cambridge Springs, Pennsylvania, Martha grew up to have a strong Character. She was very willful and always seemed to know where she wanted to go and how to get there. At the age of 14, she had earned enough money from having her writing published to pay for a trip to Niagara Falls. It was a little foretaste of things to come. In 1889, at the age of 17, she made her first trip to Europe. By 1895, she had graduated from the University of Chicago, having studied English French, classics, German, and a wide variety of other subjects. Her language training was to stand her in very good stead. In 1896, Martha suffered a serious accident at the age of 24 when she fell from her bicycle going downhill. She required an operation which rendered her unable to have children. It was perhaps this which made her keep all potential suitors at arm's length, and without it she may have lived longer and in better health. It cast a long shadow over her life and gave her a permanent distrust of doctors, hospitals and medicine. Martha's first post was as a teacher and then principal of the Union City High School in Pennsylvania. In 1900 she moved to Pittsburgh, having found the environment of the school rather too limiting for herself. Pittsburgh the home of Heinz. And to earn a living, she drew up a series of dramatised lectures on the works of Shakespeare. 
and these she performed to packed audiences and received ecstatic reviews. Splendid training for a Baha'i speaker in the making. That same year, she began a career as a feature writer in newspapers in Pittsburgh. And when the first automobile arrived in the city in 1901, she became the first automobile correspondent. And she opened an automobile section in her newspaper. This was typical of Martha. Anything like this that she saw, she seized upon immediately and made good use of. In 1902, she set sail for Europe, having persuaded her current paper to have a foreign correspondent and that she should be it. In 1903, she visited England to research her ancestors, who were, in fact, um, Puritan Englishmen and who had moved across to America uh, to escape the persecutions in England. She also visited Scotland and Ireland. By 1908, Martha was working as the Society and Religion Editor for the Pittsburgh Post. In this capacity, she was attending an interdenominational missionary conference. And it was there, or rather as a result of attending that conference, that she met Roy Wilhelm and was first informed about the faith. And it's very interesting to read the account of her meeting. Roy Wilhelm has given us a description of his first meeting with Martha Root. Arriving in Pittsburgh on a business trip, too late for hotel supper, they directed me to a nearby restaurant, Child's, which to my surprise I found crowded, even at that hour. Of course, the restaurant was crowded with people from the convention, of whom Martha was one. The head waitress finally found a seat and escorted me to a table well at the rear seating me beside four young women. And I soon gathered that I was attending a missionary convention of some sort at which representatives were mostly women. Without intentionally eavesdropping, I overheard one of these young ladies remark that it seemed a pity that all of the heathen must be lost, or words to that effect. The one sitting next vigorously took up this matter, saying that there was one creator whom she believed was interested in all human beings, and she doubted if really any souls were lost. I sensed a coolness following, but I wanted to say a word. I recalled the old saw that a man once got rich attending to his own business, but the pressure was too great, and as they left and I had to arise to let them pass, I said I could not help overhearing their conversation, and would I be permitted a word in connection, which was readily granted. In about two minutes I said that my mother and I had just returned from a visit to the East, during which we met those born into other systems of religion, And, observing that they also said their prayers and led kind, helpful lives, we now believe that all humanity were being educated to the recognition of one God and a real brotherhood of man, or something along that line. This made an appeal to Miss Martha Root, society and religious editor of the Pittsburgh Post, who gave me her card, but I did not score with the one who made the first statement. Later, when I returned to New York, I sent one of our books with a note, which in time brought a polite acknowledgement. I found that she passed it along without reading, however. Some months after, I wrote again that I would be passing through the city, and if she would be interested, she could call me in care of my broker, and I might see her after business hours and before the leaving of my train west. This resulted in meeting her at the farmer's restaurant, where we had maybe two hours. She listened attentively, asked intelligent questions, which led me to send another book, which met with better fortune after my return to New York. If my memory is correct, she then came to a convention in New York, bringing her very fine old father and possibly another friend, from which time her interest grew, and later I met some folks she gathered together in Pittsburgh, followed eventually by behind meetings. It was interesting that uh, Martha, as it were, fought shy of the Baha'i faith when she first heard of it. She intelligently investigated it as any... Uh, journalist worthy of uh, her profession would have done. And one particular Baha'i book that she'd be given, she didn't even open. She left it on the counter of the drugstore where she'd um, gone in to get something. And the wife of the drugstore owner picked up the book, read it, and became a Baha'i. So <laughs> it's a lovely uh, way of, of showing us that... Um, if we make any effort to teach the faith, even the person that we're aiming at 
may not become a Baha'i, but through them others may be. Well, eventually, of course, Martha did become a Baha'i, but it's nice that even her, her leavings, as it were, <laughs> caused other people to become Baha'is. Why did she become a Baha'i? This is something which the author um, investigates by analysing the first article that she wrote about the faith for the Pittsburgh Post. And it seems that it was the stress on unity, coupled with the simplicity and the grandeur of the Baha'i teachings, which impressed Martha very much. So the following year, Martha declared, 1909, it was a very important year. It was the year of the dethronement of Sultan Abdul Aziz of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. More particularly for the Baha'is, it was the year that Abdul Baha laid to rest the remains of the Baal on Mount Carmel. An auspicious year for a declaration. In 1912, Abdul Baha visited the United States. Martha was there to meet him with the other behinds when he landed in New York. On the 7th of May, 1912, that's a special date for Shiva and I, that's the anniversary of our engagement, <laughs> which we all celebrate along with um, our wedding anniversary. So that was rather nice to find that. It's another little link, perhaps. On the 7th of May, Martha arranged for Abdul Baha to speak in Pittsburgh. Martha had two private interviews with Abdul Baha. At the one in Pittsburgh, he presented her with a white rose, and this forever after became her favourite flower. Since 1911, two years after Martha had declared she'd been begging Abdul Baha for the privilege of travelling the world to teach the faith, and he had discouraged her at first, saying that it was dangerous for a woman travelling alone, especially to areas like the Middle East. But by the time 1915 came round when the world was at war and Abdul Baha was confined in Palestine. Martha was permitted to go on a world tour in 1915. And in many ways this was a preparatory journey for Martha to meet the friends and to see what the Baha'i situation was like around the world. And she made good use of this preparatory tour and perhaps there is an example for us there too. She made good use of all the photographs and slides that she took in talks that uh, she gave throughout the world in years to come. And even though this was in a sense a preparatory tour, even so she visited Europe, the Middle East, India, Burma. In fact, she was the first Baha'i to visit Burma. And Japan, where Agnes Alexander had already gone a little before her. <coughs> Abu Baha wrote his Tablets of the Divine Plan during the First World War, and it was not until the war had finished that they could be disseminated to the Baha'is. Martha read them in 1918 and wrote to Abu Baha of her desires to arise to teach and to visit him in the Holy Land. Abu Baha, in reply, left Martha in no doubt as to where her priorities should lie. I very much desire that thou shouldst visit the Holy Land, and thus to meet thee. But teaching stands above everything else, and if thou deemest it advisable, engage thou in the spreading of it throughout the regions of the world. Isn't that sweet? If thou deemest it advisable, leaving it in Martha's hands entirely. Martha's response was complete, and unequivocal. Accordingly, she rose in 1919 as the first to answer the call of the tablets and travelled almost unceasingly for the next 20 years to nearly every part of the globe. She passed away on September the 28th, 1939, in Honolulu, Hawaii, which Shari Effendi describes as that symbolic spot between the eastern and western hemispheres in both of which she had laboured so mightily. That's a very brief survey of her life, remembering we're looking to the significance of her life. 
And I want to look now briefly at the tablets of the divine plan. For if we study them, we may be able to pick out from them the essential guidance that pertains to those who wish to arise and teach the cause. It was these tablets which gave Martha Root her inspiration and her drive. They should do the same for us. This refers to those who wish to arise to teach the cause. Abdul Baha says, Their sustenance and food must consist of the teachings of God. First, they must themselves live in accordance with those principles, then guide the people. And Abdul Baha goes on to say, Consider His Holiness Baha'u'llah and what a high and exalted station he has destined for you. To attain to this supreme station is, however, dependent on the realization of certain conditions. The first condition is firmness in the covenant of God. The second condition, fellowship and love amongst the believers. The third condition, teachers must continually travel to all parts of the world, but they must travel like Abdul Baha, sanctified and free from every attachment and in the utmost severance. The tablets also say, commence translating tablets and books containing the proofs of this revelation and publishing those books, circulate them throughout the five continents of the globe. Abdul Bahar also says the teachers travelling in different directions must know the language of the country in which they will enter. And later he says, consequently a number of souls may arise and act in accordance with the aforesaid conditions and hasten to all parts of the world, especially from America, to Europe, Africa, Asia and Australia, and travel through Japan and China. And Martha Root fulfilled to the best of her ability, which is better than most, if not all. Every single one of those conditions, as we shall see. In <laughs> paraphrasing such an amazingly large and detailed book, I haven't even had time to read it all. But from the little bits of it that I've delved into, um, I have been very touched and moved by the story of Martha Root. And everybody obviously recommends the book that they use for their talk. But uh, I do recommend you to, to read this. It gives you all sorts of details. Um, and when we come to the end of the talk, I, I don't want questions about you know what colour were her eyes and what colour was her hair and how many brothers and sisters she had because you can read about all those things for yourself. It's the significance of her life we need to ask questions about. But there are three incidents that I've picked out of Martha Root's life which stand out for me because they illustrate uh, different aspects of Martha Root and they illustrate different aspects of teaching the faith and they give us, I hope, or they will give us uh, the courage and imagination to uh, follow her example. And the first incident was on her journey her first journey setting off to South America. Now, first of all, the problem was that the workers on the ship were on strike and the ship was delayed for a whole week in New York Harbour. And this caused Martha, as well as the other passengers, a great deal of worry and fretting and upset. And as Martha was not in particularly good health herself, this aggravated her condition. But once the ship got underway... Martha was thinking to herself, my goodness, I'm the only Baha'i on this ship. And there are people of all backgrounds and there are quite a few religious people here. There are clergymen, some high-ranking clergymen too. And what on earth can I do? But having made a decision to teach the faith and not to waste any time, on the second day she went to the captain and asked permission to speak about the Baha'i faith. And to her surprise, the captain delightedly agreed and posters were put up and a place was provided her, for her to talk. And just about everybody on the ship, except for the, um, the Chinese workers on board who were not allowed to come up from the lower decks, came to the talk and heard Martha Root speak. 
And about half of them came the following night to listen to more of what she said. And Martha was very canny in the way of, of uh, reaching people. She had done a little palmistry, partly as a party joke. She had learned a little of it. And she offered to read everyone's palm. And, of course, she was able to uh, get in direct contact with everybody on the ship who wanted their palm read. And uh, she read so many people's palms that the captain said to her, if you can read my palm again at the end of all these people and say exactly the same thing you said the first time, then uh, you know, you're, you're really something and I shall, um, I shall publicize that all around the ship and really make something big of you. And he issued her this challenge at the end of all these people that she had uh, examined their palms, he gave his palm again and she said word for word exactly what she had said before and he was most impressed with her. And not wishing to be deprived of the bounty of, of reaching the Chinese workers on board the ship, she, um, she had the message of the Baha'i faith, as it were, translated into Chinese and sent down to them so that even they heard about the faith. Uh, I think that's marvellous. She wouldn't let anybody on the ship uh, go without hearing the message of Baha'u'llah. And the second incident in her um, incredible career, where does one start, was her trip over the Andes. Now just imagine, <laughs> these are some of the highest mountains in the world. Ordinary people suffer blackouts and nosebleeds and um, shortness of breath in the rarefied atmosphere of these mountains. They're extremely dangerous. Someone likened the, uh, the trip along the mountain roads as being like walking round the, the parapet of the Woolworth building in Manhattan, New York. And if any of you have been lucky enough to visit Manhattan and see, um, I think the ledge on it is probably about the, <laughs> the width of somebody's foot. And you'll be riding on a donkey in the freezing cold in uh, these rarefied atmosphere. And the friends, when Martha said that she must go over the Andes and, and um, reach the people there to teach them about the faith, they threw their hands up in horror and said, oh, no, you can't go, you can't possibly go. But in the end, through her own determination, um, she, she went over the mountains on the back of a donkey. And there were many dangerous moments during her journey over the mountains and you must read all about it uh, I'm not going to describe it in any detail but it just shows that even somebody small and frail and ill with the help of Baha'u'llah with the determination to teach the faith and to obey every word that the master revealed in the tablets of the divine plan she achieved it and in so doing, she taught the faith in every town and city in South America. I mean, if someone's life achievement was to teach the faith in every town and city in South America, you'd think, wow, she did the same thing in India. Can you imagine? That's the second most highly populated country in the world. And that was just two of the things that she did. But the highlight of Martha Root's career, <laughs> in inverted commas, as a Baha'i teacher was, of course, the fact that she taught the faith to the first reigning monarch to accept the faith, Queen Marie of Romania, in 1926. And Martha's approach to teaching the Queen was just about the same as it would have been if the Queen had been a Chinese peasant. I think. She treated everybody the same. She loved everybody. There, were no, there was no nonsense or frills about Martha Root. She asked the um, American minister in Romania for permission to be given an audience with Queen, Queen Marie, and she was refused. Now, most people would say, OK, well, fair enough. That's it. Well, I'll try something else then. Maybe I can go and speak to the Prime Minister or whatever. No. 
Martha wrote a letter to Queen Marie and sent her a picture of Abdul Baha and Dr. Asimov's book, Baha on the New Era. And the very following day, a letter came from the palace inviting her to visit at noon. Now it appeared that when the Queen met Martha, the first thing that she said after greeting Martha wrote were the first thing she said after greeting her I believe these teachings are the solution for the world's problems today and she had stayed up until three o'clock in the morning to finish reading the book so how do we know how anybody is going to receive the faith even a queen may be touched by the message of the Baha'i faith if you only have the courage to give it and it was in 1926 that uh, Queen Marie of Romania became a Baha'i and as we know wrote so eloquently herself an accomplished writer and artist of the faith so those illustrate three incidents in the life of Martha Root we had a session earlier on in the school about the essence of faith being fewness of words and abundance of deeds. Well, I think Martha had lived up to that very much. If we look at her deeds, she travelled widely and non-stop. Despite danger, poverty, ill health, lack of language, or translated works, and often alone, for 20 years, four times round the globe. She spoke to high and low alike, to kings, queens, princes, princesses, prime ministers, presidents, academics, students, ordinary people, to all nations and creeds. In China, she spoke in over a hundred schools and colleges and universities. She met probably most of the, the leading politicians of uh, Western Europe and the Middle East. She wrote articles in newspapers, for newspapers and magazines, wherever she went. And we're talking in thousands. She presented books and pamphlets to whoever she met and wherever she spoke. And we're talking in thousands, if not more. She learned to speak Esperanto and became an accomplished Esperantist. Not only that, but she organised for Shoghi Effendi many of the Esperanto international conferences. She spoke it. She spoke, gave many of her speeches in Esperanto. And she used her Esperanto when the people that she was speaking to couldn't understand English and her French. While she was in South America, she learned to speak Spanish. And while in China, she even learned to speak Chinese, difficult as that was in order to communicate better with the people that she met. While she was in Iran, she researched and wrote A Life of Tahire, which you may have seen around. It didn't come home to me that I was given this book as a present, and Tahire, the pure, because I was interested in Tahire, as my brother-in-law and my sister gave me this book as a present. And it was only later I realised, hey, this was written by Martha Root, in itself, this is quite an achievement. And in fulfilment also of the directions of Abdul Baha and the tablets of the Divine Plan, she organised wherever she went the translation of Baha'i books and pamphlets. Sometimes they were the first Baha'i scriptures to be translated into those languages. Those were her deeds. We could talk all evening about her deeds. But I would like to say a few things about Martha's own words. Because having done so many deeds of the kind that she did, doesn't that somehow make her words more special? Well, Marzia Gale, in her introduction to Martha's books, Martha's book on Tahereh, writes, Martha's method is straight from the shoulder. She hasn't been with a person three minutes before she's given him a book or picture. She'll say to him or her, How do you do? Here's a picture of Abdul Baha. I love you. 
She herself wrote, If anyone feels timid about asking for opportunities to speak, let him remember that no day comes twice to any servant in the cause. No day comes twice to any servant in the cause. And Abdul Baha has said, to roar like a lion the words of God and sing like a bird the melodies of the kingdom. Well, it's pretty difficult, I think, to roar and sing at the same time, but Martha managed it. The great heart will not falter, and the world is ready. If ever we want any advice about how we should teach, Martha once said, if you want to give the message to anyone, love them. And if you love them, they will listen. And she reminded us, we live in moments, not in years. How many things that we've done, especially with relation to the faith, have happened because there was a moment and we decided to do something in that moment and the fruit came from it. And she also said, give something always, if only a flower, some candy or fruit. Pray that they will accept from you the greater gift. And of her illnesses and hardships on her long voyages and travels for the faith, she said that none of that mattered if we have faithfully sowed the seeds for a divine civilization. What is the significance then of Martha Root's life? For me, it is absolute and complete trust in God. How otherwise could such a person achieve all that she did? Absolute and complete obedience to Abdul Baha's words. She took him at his word. She travelled the world and she spoke to every nation on earth with perhaps the exception of the Soviet Union or Russia as it was then which she was not permitted to enter. And finally, boundless love. She loved everybody that she came into contact with and anyone who ever met her and wrote about her afterwards wrote of her unbounded love. Trust, obedience and love. At the close of her life, in September 1939, she wrote to the friends, I am so near the shore of eternity. I thank you, each and every one, for all that you will do to help me. And I thank you for your love. I would only like to ask the friends one question to think about. What will you do to help Martha? Thank you. You know, this quality of giving books and literature, because dissemination of literature is one of the points that show me a Okay, I, I have been asked to um, talk a little bit more about um, Martha's disseminating of Baha'i literature because this is something that's been emphasized so much in the faith by the Guardian as well as by Abdul Baha. And it was something that uh, Martha Root did at every opportunity. Because she herself did not speak many languages, uh, she always tried to organize wherever she went Friends, and when I say friends, um, these weren't Baha'is. Many of the people who helped her to translate the Baha'i writings into the native tongue of the people that she was visiting were not Baha'is. They were friends of Martha Root, or rather friends that she had made there. And she never wasted any opportunity. As soon as she could, 
she got the word of Baha'u'llah into print in the newspapers first and then she, she used to travel with um, these tiny little pamphlets which were really small in fact I think they, they have a name uh, Little Ben or something and Big Ben <laughs> I'm not too sure Betty may know better than me and these tiny little pamphlets were very often the basis of, of what she had translated and I mean I, I'm I made a list, for example, or I tried to make a list of all the places that she visited in which year and I covered one and a half sides of just the lists of the countries that she visited and uh, had I had time I would have made a list of all the languages that she was responsible for translating the Baha'i writings into for the first time and I think the list would have been almost as long because many of these countries had never had Baha'i writings before. We must remember that she was the first Baha'i to visit uh, South America she was the first Baha'i in Burma and so many other countries she was the first Baha'i to step into and so she had perhaps the greatest opportunity for breaking fresh ground of anyone and sometimes there's a, a feeling one has well she was lucky I didn't have that chance but the point was that having been given all that op opportunity she took it every single opportunity she had she took and how many of us can say that so yes everywhere she went she left behind her people busily translating the words of Baha'u'llah many of them not even Baha'is but they were servants of the cause in that sense and so the word of Baha'u'llah was given to the people she met in their own language does that answer your question at all? Martha met many. Uh, and the question is, um, was there any particular reason why she visited Queen Mary of Romania? Um, Martha made it a policy to speak to anyone and everyone uh, who would listen. And so she asked for audiences with many heads of state and uh, crowned heads and, and spoke to many. I mean, for example, she met uh, King Zog of Albania, and um, it was interesting that she should pick Queen Mary of Romania because through Queen Mary she was introduced to many other of the royal families of Europe because of course they were all related to Queen Victoria but, and that perhaps is our clue that unconsciously she was guided to a descendant of the one monarch who did not dismiss Baha'u'llah's message uh, I think the hand of divine providence was in that rather than anything particularly deliberate on Martha's part. In your reading, you may find something different. Uh. When uh, Martha Ruth arrived in Manila, uh, in one of her visits, she didn't have much time. She had only a few hours while the boat was um, refueling. So she went to town, and she went to the library, and she asked the librarian if she could put some Baha'i books in that library. But the librarian declined. While she was standing there, she, she left a few pamphlets on the table of the library, and she left. And um, a man had come 200 miles from interior to attend a court case in the capital and took those pamphlets with him. And always at the back of the pamphlet was Martha Root's address where this person could write for more information. And he got the information, and through correspondence, he became a Baha'i. And there were quite a few Baha'is in that area before the first pioneer ever went to uh, Philippines. And uh, I think we Baha'is, as, as you have asked us, really try to help Martha Root. This is the easiest thing we can do, is to buy and, uh, quite a lot of books and pamphlets and try uh, to, and to use it wisely, of course, but to try to disseminate the literature. There are so many stories of people just uh, reading a book and becoming interested and becoming a Baha'i or looking through a pamphlet. And one, one, this is one of the easiest ways that we can help Martha Root. The beloved guardian, 
to the Persian friends, and it's dated 1927 or 26, June of 1926. And the Guardian is dedicated, this is to the NSA of Iran, and is encouraging them. But most of it from here, because Trevor is a great Persian, from here <laughs> speak, to, to this part is all about Martha Root. He describes her in terms of great love. This is not when she's passed. This is in the middle of her activities. She's just opened as well, the Queen of Mary. So it's all tremendous love about how she's a handmaiden, she's describing to the Persians about Chinese as Chinese a handmaiden who's got these qualities of sai, which means endeavor, hemat, enthusiasm, oftadegi, humility, farzanegi, detachment, sobat, steadfastness, taqwa, piety, enqita, which is again another form of it. In summary, she says, sarhalge, that is the top rank of all the servants of this cause. Men and women. It's quite astonishing, you know, it comes to NSA of Iran and all men, you know, sitting there. But it's really fascinating. <laughs> you know, no, I mean, you know, this is just, for me, interesting, you know, in the whole picture. You know, you, you try to get the spirit of the faith from these words. In Khanum and Muhtarame, and then describes Khanum, which is, for the Persians, the great sense of honor, Khanum, you know. Beti Khanum. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a good thing to say to somebody. Khanum. In Khanum and Muhtarim, Amatullah al Muqarram, and then he describes. Then he goes on. Now, I won't, I'm not forgotten your point. Describes the condition. He says, she is bimu'in, no one to help her. Alil is weakened. Bezawati Muzjad, not uh, rich financially, not. Munqati an an al jihad, but very detached. And then he says, she went to these parts, but more recently, Bulgar was Soglab, Bulgaria and these areas of Romania. She went there just like other parts, you see. Monand is Sa'ere Bulgan. Monand means exactly the same method she has everywhere else. Teach. And what does she tell them? Exactly as you say, she's telling the Persians. She goes and tells them, Qad Atal Ma'ud, the promised one has come. Qad Atal Rahman, the all merciful has come. Because this is in Arabic, the words of Baha'u'llah. But they're so telegraphic, you know. I think, you know, the promise, who has come? Qad Atal Ma'ud, the promised one has come. Qad Atal Rahman, you know, Bismillah rahman God the merciful has come. She says this, you see, and then she tells it to the, to the, to the high, to the low, to the uh, everyone. Then going on to, to the exact method, she says, she, her method was to address anybody who, whom she could high and low university people. Then he says, Albi Atish. All the time her heart is burning. Ruhi Mohem. Her heart, her spirit is Mohem. Now Mohem actually means important, but in fact the Arabic of here, Mohem means she's got no other intention. Ehtemam. In other words, very single minded in this. And she wanted very personally to see Shahsan. She entered the capital of Romania. When she arrived in the capital of that country, the heart of Her Majesty the Queen, as was a bit disturbed, perturbed, from the behavior of her heir to the throne. The queen, dowager queen, but her son was going to be the king after a time. But she was dissatisfied with her son. But the son was not in the line of what she wanted him to continue doing. And also, she was disturbed as in Keshvari, the queen was disturbed by the country, the situation in the country, the disturbance. Now, this is the crux of the moment. Martha Ruth was Peyombare Farah wa Salam. She was the Peyombare. This is the title of a, a messenger. The messenger of Farah, of joy and peace. Forsat Raghanimat Shubut. Forsat. Got hold of the opportunity. It's almost like grabbing it. You know, in Persian, Raghanimat Shubut. She grabbed the opportunity. Tabajjoh b'mogallebul gulub kart. Turned her heart to the one who changes all the hearts. Gave the message. And then it goes on. She gave the message and stole her heart. Rabud. Just almost like a, stealing somebody's heart and making them fall in love with it. She, she stole the heart with the magnet of the love of God, gave her the comfort, and then, she says, goes on, she then, like a lightning, left that country and went to other countries. Doesn't sort of, you know, staying there, thinking, <laughs> what a good job I've done. She says, Chon, 
he says, Chon lam e nur, like a lightning that comes. She, the diyar okhra bishet oft, hurried away to other countries. <laughs> so the method, she, I think she came to the scene, realized, or, oh, you know, what the queen and the servant, and then grabbed the opportunity, gave, turned to Bahala. It's just, I mean, it's indescribable. But in the, re- reading the Guardian, the way she's describing it, he's describing it to the Persians, you get, and then he says, the Guardian's last word. Uh, this is really when, of course, it makes you, in this manner should you all do. And the whole thing stops. This is, of course, all this is in Persian, the last sentence in Arabic, which is that word which Abdul Baha uses in the covenant, in the, in the tablets of the covenant. That word, in this path should you all go, is an exact English translation of it. The answer.